Good morning, God Adventure family. So good to see you. Good Jen, morning. It's been a good week. It's been a great week. God's in a good mood. He's always in a good mood. I just love what he's doing. And uh, thank you again for joining us this morning. Um, we don't take it for granted. It's such a privilege. And uh, yeah, we just, I, I actually just want to take this moment, Jen, just to just to honor our God Adventure yeah. family. Uh, um, this has just been an incredible season. Yeah. There's so much stuff going on around, but, but I just see so many of our God Adventure people just stepping up, taking their place, standing up, and just being shining lights in their communities. It's just such a blessing. Um, every week we just hear stories of, of people just uh, applying their faith and just being shining lights in our city. Yeah, yeah, we just so blessed. So, I mean, that's just in, um, just so encouraging. And by the way, you know what I hear for this message or what I hear for this morning as we sit here, I just hear God is saying that hope is going to be restored. I feel, I feel God is saying for some of you that there's been a cloud hanging over you. <laughs> it's been doom and gloom, but light is about to burst forth. So, Lord, we just thank you that your yeah. light is bur um, bursting forth just this picture behind us, just uh, the sunbeams um, shining through the through the forest. Come this on. is going to be a day of light bursting forth, hope being restored. Um, also, hear the word sinusitis. Some of you are being healed of sinusitis. Um, some of you are having problems with allergies. It might be sinusitis, whatever it is. But that's being healed yeah, right now on. in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Amen. What I'm also hearing is I hear... Um, I hear God is saying, are you willing to give up your Isaac? Some of you had an idea, some of you have a dream, and you've heard from God, but God is saying, are you willing to give up your Isaacs? And I remember um, Bill Johnson, he um, once said that a lot of Isaacs are being sacrificed because people acted on what God said yesterday and stopped listening to what he's saying now. So right now, I just release grace over you to hear um, the now, the rhema word of the Lord. Mm. Not, not that we, um, um, not stewarding um, previous prophetic words, but I feel God is saying, um, are you willing to give up your Isaac and trust God with your Isaac? Mm. So wow. I just bless you with that. And then, wow, in a Pretorius family, we just had an incredible week. We, um, we, um, we had a great celebration. We were celebrating Jen's parents, our parents' 50 wedding anniversary yesterday. Mm -hmm. So we just want to bless mom, um, mom Liz and dad, Ashley, 50 years mm -hmm. of marriage life and demonstrating to us what love looks like um, and giving us a glimpse yeah. of what the kingdom is like because uh, the kingdom is a whole marriage dance. So, yeah, yeah I'm going to hand over to Jen. Yeah. You've got some powerful thoughts on worship this morning. I love about the kingdom, so take it away, Jane. Yeah, that um, uh, as Corne was sharing about my parents, um, 50 years, their golden anniversary celebrated yesterday. Um, I, I was reflecting on that and the experience we had yesterday with them, and um, I, I just felt God uh, leading me um, to, to really explore a little bit around that in terms of worship. And using that as an analogy, it's amazing how, you know, we can see aspects of God all around us um, when we just, he, he is manifest in his creation. He is manifest in the people around us, in our families and the dynamics. I um, mean, God is all about family and he's all about marriage. And um, so I was actually, I was uh, uh, praying this morning about this worship moment and I, I got a message from someone on my phone. Um, Carol Kim, she had been uh, just praying and she had just got this revelation, this renewed revelation. Uh, um, and, and she said to me, you know, the, the groom is so in love with his mm. bride. The groom is in love. He, not, he doesn't just love his bride, he's in love with her, her. And it just took me back to a moment that we had with my parents last night. My dad had, um, he had wanted to, he had wanted us to be witness to him affirming his love for his bride and uh, it, it was such a privilege and um, he had he had been plotting and planning in the week and he had a gift for her and um, 
we, we led up to this moment where he presented her with a gift and he just affirmed his love for her. And, and my mum was obviously very emotional. We were all very emotional. And, and, and her response was, oh, but I, I haven't done anything for you. I haven't got anything for you. And I, I was watching my dad at this point and I could see, he just laughed and I could see that her receiving his love her receiving the gift um, that he had so carefully and thoughtfully prepared for her was enough. It was more than enough. That's all he required. He was just reveling in her surprise. He was reveling in her, um, reveling in his love for her. And, and, that, and, and God just was speaking to me about that this morning. And, you know, so often in worship, we, we feel like we come, we come to church, we think that that's where we worship. And, and we try to work up some emotion, or we, we, we worship out of a sense of duty, we worship out of a sense, I owe this to God, he's, he's done all these things for me, and now it's my turn to give him back something. And there is an element of that. We, but, you know, the worship in the Old Testament and worship in the New Testament are two different things mm. because something happened between the Old and the New Testament. Uh, God, the Father, gave the gift of the Son. And, and our greatest act of worship, where worship begins, is us having this revelation that the groom is in love with the bride. And he's in love with me. He's in love with me. And, you know, for some of us, uh, you don't have a marriage like that, or you might not be married, you might have lost your spouse in some way. Some of you might not ever have experienced someone on earth being in love with you, but there is someone mm. who is in love with you, and he's wanting you to have a revelation of that this morning. So, uh, and, and that's where worship begins, when we have that revelation, it's, it's just when we just begin to receive, when we yeah. just begin to revel in that love and go, you know, and, and what I do when I need to be reminded of this, I, I tell it to myself. I, mm. I just, you know, so I think that's what we can do. Um, yeah. You know, we just, we tell us he's in love with me and <laughs> I, I, I am, I'm so loved. Mm. I'm, I'm the apple of his eye. Mm. Who am I? Who am I that he is mindful of me? And yet, and yet, so just hold out your hands, friends. Just hold out mm. your hands and let's just, sure. let's just access that. Let's just mm. settle into that. Thank you. I just take Jesus. a deep breath and we just position ourselves. Yeah. We quieten our souls. Yeah. Last week we just learned about yeah, being still in his presence. We just quieten our souls. We speak to our souls, be still. Our emotions. And we welcome love. Sure. We welcome love. Mm -hmm. We welcome your love. We are at the receiving end of your love. There is nothing we can bring. Nothing that can measure up. Nothing that can match it. Not, nothing we can do. No act of service. Mm -hmm. sure. We just position ourselves beneath the, the raging waterfall of love. Thank you. Mm. Mm. He is jealous for me, loves like a hurricane, I am a tree. Bending beneath the weight of his grace and mercy. And oh, how he loves me so. Oh, how he loves me. How he loves me so. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, he loves us.
And he is jealous for me. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his grace and mercy. Yeah. Yeah, we just bend. Yeah. We just bend beneath Thank the weight you of your, your wind, the weight of your grace, the weight of your mercy. Thank you for your love. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for yeah. torrents of love. Yeah. I thank you for torrents mm. of love. Mm. Mm. I thank you for torrents of love into dry and arid places. Yeah. Torrents of love into dry deserts. Even now, those parched areas in your lives. Those areas that have mm. felt forsaken. Those areas that have felt parched and dry. Mm. Those areas that feel like there is no growth, mm. that the earth is cracked and barren. I thank you. I, I just have a picture of the, the rains and the, the floods that come down in the Karoo, in those, those desert places. And the, the, the desert is transformed in a moment as the floods, as the rains fall and transforms the landscape. I thank you that you're bringing transformation, that you are watering dry places, mm. that you're flooding hearts and minds and souls and emotions mm. and spirits with the awareness, mm. awareness of your love, the great magnitude of your love, a love so powerful and so sweeping that nothing can hold it back. A love that is stronger than death, a love that is stronger than the grave, a love that cannot separate us. A love that is greater than your past, a love that is greater than your future, than your present, a love that is not contained by time or boundaries or the spirit realm, nothing, nothing greater nothing more powerful than his love for you. And it's love. I feel like some of you need to know that it's love that makes a way in those impossible mm. places mm. that you might be experiencing. Mm. Love will make a way. Yeah. His love makes a way. His love conquers all. Yeah, no, I feel mm. like um, some of you have really been crippled by fear. And I know mm. we, um, we quote it all the time that perfect love casts out fear. Mm. But um, it's, uh, you know, we can say it, but he wants you to experience mm. it. He wants you to experience <coughs> love like that tide, like that raging water that literally washes away fear. Mm. So, um, yeah, if, if you can see your fear, give it a, give it a face. Give fear a face. And um, position it in your imagination. Position f fear in in the river. Sure. See it in the river. Mm -hmm. And now we call forth those raging waters. We call forth that raging storm mm -hmm. that comes on the tide. to wash that away, that you would see that fear being overwhelmed by the wave, by the waves, by the torrents mm. of his love. Mm. We thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son, sure. the beautiful gift of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We thank you for the unconditional love that held nothing back from mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. The great
greatest gift that you could give, you gave him freely. about love. I don't know if you've even noticed, but some people who are in love are just happy. Yeah. <laughs> that's why that's why sometimes we just come undone in his presence because people are in love are just joyful. They, I've never seen someone in love that is grumpy, who is depressed, who <laughs> feel discouraged. Yeah. Um, when we allow him to love in us, you just have a smile on your face. It just it just comes out. Yeah. And Jen, when I <laughs> <laughs> More Lord. Yeah. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your presence. Yeah. But I love I, I like what you said. Um our worship is really a response mm. to mm. his love. And I think sometimes we make this is so important to understand. Sometimes we worship in order to receive love. Yeah. We worship yeah. in order to receive his love yeah. and his goodness. But it's actually the, the, the beginning point is actually just to be still, as you and Steve were sharing last week and this morning, to just, you know what, the, the purest form, mm. what I'm hearing is the purest form of worship is actually allowing Him to love on us. Yeah. Because there's nothing that He needs. Mm. But when I say, Papa, here I am, <laughs> yeah. he has your favorite children, <laughs> your favorite son, your favorite daughter, and you give Him the privilege, the honor of just loving us yeah yeah that is worship to the father and that is as we get flooded <laughs> as we get flooded with his love man worship just flow yeah. adoration just yeah. flow yeah and so i i just break up all religion off yeah. of people I, I break up the lie that that we yeah. have to impress god you know what god doesn't just love you i mean we know god's love he loves everyone but you know what he actually likes you he likes to be yeah. around you he likes to spoil on you. And so the best thing, the, the, the biggest act of worship is just say, Papa, here I am. Yeah. Jesus, just love on yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. Just love on me. Yeah. Just love on me. Yeah. So yeah. that was so powerful. <laughs> it was, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, you can, I just, everything else just falls away. All those sure. little foxes, those things mm. that just are niggling you know when you just position yourself in that that torrent of his love it's just this is it this is the this is this is it this is the kingdom um just experiencing and reveling yeah. in his love and being transformed and in that moment we are transformed this is where yeah. transformation happens this is where all that stuff in us that um we we want dealt with and we want he it's it's in this place when we position ourselves mm. in the river in the the waterfall of his love that he begins to transform so yes that's um that's our worship moment for this morning i mean i could sit here this is just so good i'm i'm i'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit drunk so you know in in, in front of the camera I don't, I don't, <laughs> Yeah, I uh, probably should um, let you let you get on with it. Um, so it's been lovely sharing with you. I'm going to go and enjoy from the other side of the, the camera. Bless you. Have a fantastic day. And uh, we'll possibly see you um, broadcasting from God Adventure next week, I believe. That might be a possibility. Mm. Yeah, we're starting to um, transition soon. Um, obviously, we'll let you know, but... Uh, more and more, we're just um, gearing towards that. We're putting structures in place. So, yeah, we might be broadcasting. Might not might not be in front of a, a crowd, but it might be in front of a camera and a few. Um, but we'll let you know. Could please continue to pray for us. Yeah. We often say it, we don't respond to, to fear. We don't respond to, to public opinion or peer pressure. We respond to Jesus. We live in response to what heaven is doing. And so we just want to be... Um, wise we want to be yeah. good stewards and just um, also for the safety of our community but we are we are truly excited so let us not get too comfortable on our couches let us not get in a rut um, on our in our um, bedrooms on the bed um, watching facebook live man this is so powerful there's grace for this we're going to continue with this but man is something when we get together
Mm. And I want to tell you, where two or three are gathered together, that's where the church yeah. is. Where two or three are ga gathered, yes, they with mm. us. Um, but there's something when we come together yeah. um, corporately um, that there's a prophetic, um, a, a prophetic uh, uh, um, anointing that mm. it's being released. And, and that's why it's so important for us to gather together. Mm. And um, mm. soon that's going to happen. Yay. Woo. Well, bless you guys. I love you. Have a super day. And yeah, enjoy the message. It's going to be powerful. It's going to change your life. Jen, thank you so much for joining me this morning. And uh, wow, I'm just still feeling his presence so strong. I just want to encourage you. It's never too late to stop drinking. Never stop drinking. Continue to drink. Let me just move my tree out of the way. Bless the Smith family for blessing us with this tree, tree of life here behind me. Michelle Atlas painting on that side. So this morning, I want to speak, I want to take some time and just remind us of what we are part of. Um, I, 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 I want to remind us of the hope that we have. I want to remind us of the family that we belong to. And I want to remind us of the kingdom that we are part of. And that's also my, my um, you might have seen there on the screen, my sermon title this morning is, The Kingdom of Heaven is at Hand. The Kingdom of Heaven is at Hand. In Matthew 3, <clears throat> We read about John the Baptist. One of the first things when John the Baptist came out of the world, in the wilderness, as when he started his ministry, one of the first things that John the Baptist said was this, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then in, in Matthew 4, 17, we also see it with Jesus. As Jesus started his earthly ministry, um, he came with one message. He came with one message loud and clear. Over and over and over again. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I don't know about you, but um, for me, I always thought that repentance was feeling bad about something that I did. It was feeling bad about messing up, shedding a few tears. Jesus, I'm so sorry. Um, confess my sin. Um, and I'll never do it again. And of course, that's important. That's needed. But you know what? <clears throat> Excuse me. That is only a small part of what repentance actually means. Repentance is, um, it comes from the root Greek word, which means metanoa. And that word literally means to think in a new way or a change of mindset, a change in the way you think. So, in other words, so when John the Baptist came and when Jesus came, when they said repent, they were saying, change the way you think for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And to paraphrase it, what Jesus was um, saying, what John the Baptist was saying is think differently about the kingdom. Change the way you think, otherwise you will not see what I'm doing. Change the way you, you think, otherwise you're not going to get it. And so... If we only, if we narrow repentance down to only means that we are sorry for something, then we have repented enough for forgiveness, but we haven't repented enough for transformation. And so many of us have repented from something, from sin, which again, which is important, but we haven't repented towards something, towards something better. And so it is time for us to repent also for transformation. It's time for us to repent to something higher. It's time for us to repent to kingdom thinking, to a higher way, a higher realm of living and thinking. So repentance is not just for the forgiveness of sin, but repentance is really to change the way we think and to think higher, to think and look what does the kingdom look like. To live with a superior reality. To live with the reality of heaven. And so when Jesus came and he preached this radical message. When he came and he preached this kingdom message. This kingdom message he didn't just preach for the sinners. He didn't just preach it for the worst of the sinners. 
but he also preached it to the church. He preached it um, to the religious of the day. He was saying, repent, for there's a better way of living. There's a better way of doing things. And he was saying, turn from your own views. Turn from your own opinions. Change your way of thinking. Change or, or repent and, and um, repent from your own righteousness and turn and humble yourself for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom is about to burst forth. It is here and it's available. And so repentance, this repent part is really important. It's really important because you can't get the kingdom while you are still holding on to your own way of thinking, your own opinions, your own ideologies, your own ways. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, God will never violate his word, but he will violate our understanding of his word. And I feel God is saying, repent, think differently for I'm about to, to my kingdom is about to burst forth in a new spectacular way that you haven't experienced it before. So, in fact, um, so we don't just repent from sin, as I said, but we repent of self. We repent from anything that is missing the mark. We repent from anything that is less of God. I repent of self. Anything that, as Jen was saying, anything that is less of less than love, we have to repent from. And so <clears throat> that's why Jesus tells us in John 3 verse 3, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So repentance is really important. And Jesus said that because he knew that the temptation would be and still exists. That we want the kingdom without paying the price. We want the kingdom without sacrifice, without paying the entrance fee. And the entrance fee is repentance. The entrance fee as dying to self, dying to my opinions, my way of thinking, my narrative, and repent higher towards kingdom thinking. And so I know this is not always a popular message, but I want to tell you this is the gospel of the kingdom. This is the only way. And so, you know what, everyone, I think everyone loves the concept of the kingdom until they discover that the kingdom is found or it means the cross it means sacrifice and so unless we die to self unless i lay down my ideas my perspectives my way of doing willing to lay down my pride i won't see the kingdom and so this is a message to the church today unless we repent we will not see the kingdom unless we repent we will not be in alignment with what God is doing on the earth today. And again, as I said, I believe heaven is about to break in in a fresh way. I believe that there's a sovereign move of God trying to break into our nation right now. And Jesus is saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So I honestly believe that in the midst of the brokenness that we're experiencing in this season, in the midst of all the pain, all the confusion, all the, the division and all the junk that we are facing in our nation, in the nations of the world, God is reminding us of His way. God is reminding us of a better way. And He says, change the way you think because my kingdom will always lead to hopeful beliefs. My kingdom will always cause you to come to conclusions of peace, of hope for a better future. And I'm telling you, it is go time in the kingdom. It is go time in the spirit. But church, we have to repent. Some of us are feeling hopeless. Some of us are feeling discouraged because we haven't repented to something higher. We haven't changed our mind to come into alignment with the kingdom of heaven. And so when Jesus is speaking about his kingdom, when he's speaking about his kingdom, Jesus was very clear that his kingdom or that the kingdom of God wasn't found on human reasoning. 
the kingdom of God could not be found in human systems. In fact, in John 18 verse 36, I'm going to read a lot of scriptures this morning. So again, um, please dot them down or maybe someone can write them down there on the Facebook feed. So, uh, so you can access them later again. And um, so, yeah, in, in John 18 verse 36, Jesus is speaking to a political leader. He's speaking to Pilate. And he turns to Pilate, John 18 verse 36, and Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. In other words, Jesus was very clear. His authority didn't come from worldly systems. So Jesus was speaking, of, he was speaking to a political leader to Pilate about another political group wanting to kill him and he responds by saying my authority my ways and my kingdom doesn't come from here it is not established on man's systems and man's politics Jesus knew exactly where his source was he knew where his authority came from and while everyone else was fighting when there was so much division and polarization Everyone was fighting from a human um, point of view, from, human, from a human perspective, through human systems, human ideas. And Jesus came with a radical new message. He came with a, um, a, a new way of doing, moving, acting and speaking. He spoke about the higher kingdom reality, about the superior realm. And church, I feel God is saying it is time to get out of the valley. It is time to get out of the mindsets of the kingdom of this world. It is time to stop living from this human realm and repent um, to a different way of thinking, to kingdom thinking. And so, again, it, it, it's important to understand that Jesus' message, um, all those political systems Jesus was speaking about, um, of course, eventually it would... Um, his message would impact all those political systems and those environments, but it wasn't going to come through human effort. And Jesus realized that. And so it, it's important that you hear me on this. When Jesus came and started his earthly ministry, Jesus was very clear in his mission and his mandate. Jesus wasn't going to go and pick a side. Jesus loved the Romans as much as he loved the Jews. Jesus came for them all. And so, see, the kingdoms, the kingdoms of this world, the human systems of this world wants to separate us, wants to separate people um, between left and right, between black and white, between straight and gay, between um, Republican and and Democrat between ANC and DA and EFF and whatever you have. But the only division that really matters is the separation, the polarization between a worldview based on the kingdom of heaven and a worldview based on the kingdoms of this world. And God is saying there's a superior way of doing things and it is found in the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus came to introduce them all, um, slave and free, men and women, young and old, Jew and Romans. He came and introduced them all to a higher way. And Jesus realized that his ability to impact the world, that his ability to impact them could not be um, coming from aligning to a political agenda or anybody's side, anybody's agenda, but rather pulling them all, the left and the right, um, the Jews and the Romans, into a higher kingdom perspective, into a superior realm. And you need to understand this. This must have been quite a painful, this must have been a hard adjustment, um, especially for the Jews to make during those times, uh, during that um, era of history and no wonder they hated him so much for this radical new message that he was bringing to them 
because they were so deeply embedded in their own ways. They were so deeply embedded in their own understanding, their own perspective of, of how they thought God was going to bring his kingdom. They thought he was going to bring it by force. He thought they, were to, he, he, they thought that he was going to bring um, um, force to set them free from their Roman oppressors. And Jesus came and he flipped all of that around and he says, No, I want you to repent to my ways because my way is not your way. And, and so even more dangerously, a lot of them thought, that they were in alignment with what God was doing and they justified their own um, speech, their own agendas, thinking that that was the kingdom of heaven and they were so narrow in their own understanding. But Jesus came with this radical new message of repentance, to think differently and he began to explain what his kingdom was like. And then, he started to teach on that, and we all are so familiar with um, the Beatitudes. And I want you, if you've got your Bibles with you, um, I want you to um, turn to Matthew 5. And Jesus was rolling out this new way of thinking and living. And he did this while everyone was still fighting, everyone was still arguing. There was so much division, there was so much tension, so much anger. And Jesus is like, hey, just, just sit down, just listen. I've got a better way of reasoning. I've got a better way of dealing with people and of thinking. And he began to teach in this way. And I'm going to read this um, way to you from Matthew 5. Matthew 5 verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for this is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revel and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad glad for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you you are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its flavor how shall it be seasoned it is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under foot by men you are the light of the world a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Man, I love this. So Jesus began to outline that the kingdom is so vastly different to what they thought it would look like and what they thought Jesus was supposed to do. So I want to read this again from the Passion Translation. And if you want, you can just close your eyes, maybe just sit back and just let this truth soak into your spirit. Let, let it transform your mind. Let it just refresh your mind. Um, let this truth just wash over you. So um, this is just too good not to read again. So from, um, from the Passion Translation, I want you, almost I want you to picture like, you are hearing this for the first time. I want you to picture sitting there on the hillside um, hearing this message for the first time in a political um, tense climate that the uh, um, Jews were finding themselves and you are part of the crowd. One day, Jesus saw a vast crowd of people gathering to hear him. So he went up the slope of the hill and sat down. 
With his followers and disciples spread all over the hillside, Jesus began to teach them. What wealth is offered you when you feel spiritual poverty? For there is no charge to enter the realm of heaven's kingdom. What delight comes to you when you wait upon the Lord? For you will find what you long for. What blessing comes to you when gentleness lives within you? For you will inherit the earth. How enriched you are when you are when you crave righteousness, for you will be surrounded with fruitfulness. How satisfied you are when you demonstrate tender mercy, for tender mercy will be demonstrated to you. What bliss you experience when your heart is pure, for then your eyes will open to see more and more of God. How blessed you are when you make peace. For then you will, you will be recognized as a true child of God. How enriched you are when you bear the wounds of being persecuted for doing what is right. For that is when you experience the realm of heaven's kingdom. How ecstatic you can be when people insult and persecute you and speak all kinds of cruel lies about you because of your love for me. So leap for joy since your heavenly reward is great, for you are being rejected the same way the prophets were before you. Your lives are like salt among the people, but if you, like salt, become bland, how can your saltiness be restored? Flavorless salt is good for nothing and will be thrown out and trampled on by others. Your lives light up the world, did others see your light from a distance? For how can you hide the city that stands on a hilltop? And who would light the lamp and then hide it in, a, in an obscure place? Instead, it's a place where everyone in a house can benefit from its light. So don't, light, don't hide your light. Let it shine brightly before others. So that the commendable things you do will shine as light upon them. And then they will give their praise to your Father in heaven. I love this. I love this. And if you read that, and I want to encourage you, just take this week, go and meditate on, on Matthew 5, 6 and 7. But if you go and read on, Jesus goes on and he, go, uh, he goes on and he starts to deconstruct anger. He started to deconstruct pride. He started to de deconstruct judgment and retaliation. And he teaches on loving your enemies. He go on and he teaches on how to respond to people who treat you wrongfully. How to respond to people um, who judge you and who say false things against you. He talks about giving to the poor. Um, he talks about prayer. So Jesus came and he flipped all the ideas, all the opinions upside down. And so to those who felt that the anger was right and justified, he says, love your enemies. To those who felt that the poor and the marginalized deserved to be in that position, he says, give generously to them. To those who were using everything that they had to build a life for themselves, he says, Stop doing that and rather focus on the kingdom and start storing up treasures for yourself in heaven. To those who are being wrongfully treated, he says, show radical mercy. Don't retaliate. Don't start some other campaign. And he just came and introduced him to a whole radical new way of thinking, of dealing with people. A much higher realm of authority. A more difficult realm. And he began to invite humanity into this new way of thinking, of living and interacting with people. But it started with repentance. Repent. Think in a new way for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And unless you change the way you think and deal with people, you will not get it. You will not um, you will not 
um, have authority, you will not have influence and you will not see tran um, transformation. And instead of transformation, you will see division and separation. You know what? I was thinking about those people sitting there listening to the Sermon on the Mount. I was thinking about those people listening to Jesus. And I thought about the time in history that that occurred. I was thinking about Jesus speaking to a people group that was usually oppressed, who were judged, who were marginalized. And I wonder if the South African church was sitting there that day, if we were sitting there that day, what would our response be to a message like that? Would we sit through that whole sermon or would we get up and walk away in offense? Would we get up and say, but Jesus, you don't understand. Yes, Jesus understands. That's why he came with that message. But Jesus, you don't know that I've experienced oppression for my whole life. You don't know what they've done to me. You don't know how it means to be persecuted. You don't know. And Jesus is like, I want you to repent because there's a better way. I want you to repent. I want to invite you to a different way of living. And friends, that is how, that's my question this morning. How would we have responded to a message like that? How are we responding to that message today? There's so much division. There's so much anger. There's so much hatred. There's so much judgment in the world. I mean, I just scroll through Facebook and I see, forget about the world, how many Christians are having a go at other Christians. And my question is this this morning, would our hunger for the kingdom outweigh our hunger for our souls? Would our hunger for the kingdom far outweigh our hunger to be right and for my view to be heard and for my... <laughs> political campaign or my theological debate or whatever the case may be or would we fall down on our faces in repentance willing to do whatever it takes for God's kingdom to break through for God's kingdom to break through in my heart and my city and in my nation or would we be satisfied with a, a, a watered down kingdom that allows us to still hold on to my opinion, where it's about us versus them. My opinion versus your opinion. My argument against your argument. My pride, my sin. Friends, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to say, sound dramatic, <laughs> but I truly believe that, that God is cleansing his house. In fact, this morning, as I was praying again, I feel God is detoxing us. God is detoxing um, our minds. He's detoxing our hearts. He's detoxing His church. And I believe that the church is standing at the crossroads. The church is standing at the crossroads where we have to choose between obedience and convenience. And what we choose in this hour will determine our legacy. Are we going to choose convenience? Are we going to choose my way, my opinion? my pride, my perspective, or are we going to choose obedience? Are we going to choose repentance? Are we going to choose the kingdom? And in this process of repentance, show the world a better way of dealing with one another. Showing the world a better way of living. And this is what I believe God is doing in this hour. God is doing a massive restorative work in the church he's doing a, a cleansing a healing and a freeing in the church and i believe he's doing this that when the doors flung wide open when we flock back to our corporate places of, of of worship when we gather corporately as a church together in one building that when people come and join us that they won't find judgment they won't find hatred they won't find shame they won't find a bickering and arguing. They won't find everything that they are face, um, seeing in the nations, that they're seeing on, on social media. But they will find a kingdom narrative. 
They will find love. They will find a narrative of hope, of peace, of jo joy. Where miracles break out, where people are being set free to be themselves. And then Jesus carries on in Matthew 7. In Matthew 7 verse 13 to 14, Jesus says, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is a gate and broad is a way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is a gate and difficult is a way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So Jesus is saying that our standard can't be the standard of the world. Our standard can't be what everyone else is doing. That is a white road. Our standard has to be Christ. Our standard has to be the righteousness of Jesus. Our standard has to be the word of God. But it comes at a cost. It comes at a cost. It requires us to lay down our lives. It requires us to lay down our opinions. It requires us to lay down our hurts, our opinions. It, it requires us to listen, to listen to what other people are saying instead of telling them how it should be. It requires us to repent for the sake of the kingdom. And it's a sacrifice that leads to life. It's a sacrifice that leads to hope. It's a sacrifice that leads to his kingdom coming in a way that will unify everyone. It's a kingdom reality that, that shows radical mercy, radical acts of kindness. A kingdom that drips with love, with compassion, with meekness, with empathy. And when we do that, that is a path to life. That is a path to the kingdom. That is our place of authority and that is a kingdom that God has invited us. That is a kingdom that we are part of. And I've, I want to tell you, friends, that this, this path is not difficult. It is impossible. <laughs> That's why we need Holy Spirit. That's why we need the presence so desperately. Because only by God's grace, and God's grace is His supernatural ability that enable us to do what is humanly impossible. That is the kingdom way. Romans 14, 70 to 20, Paul unpacks it in this way. Romans 14, 17. He says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of rules about food and drink. And again, the context here is a church is having arguments, they're having debates about what they should and what they shouldn't eat. They're fighting again. They're having different opinions. But the kingdom is in a realm of the Holy Spirit, filled with righteousness, peace, and joy. Serving Jesus by walking in these kingdom realities pleases God and earns the respect of others. So then, Make it your top priority to live a life of peace with harmony in your relationships, eagerly seeking to strengthen and encourage one another. And here it is. Listen to this, verse 20. Stop ruin, ruining the work of God by insisting on your own opinions. Stop ruining the work of God by insisting on your own opinions. In other words, giving your own opinions when it is not rooted in peace, joy, and righteousness is ruining the work of God. Working real hard to get your opinion out there on social media. Working real hard to get your perspective across when it is not rooted in joy, peace, and righteousness. Righteousness with God, righteousness with people is ruining the work of God. Luke 12, verse 32, Jesus says, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Matthew 16, verse 19, And I will give you, Jesus speaking, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. 
And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then Jesus goes on and he sends out his disciples with this message. Go and preach the gospel of the kingdom. Go and preach it and demonstrate it. And then he says in Matthew 20 verse 24 verse 14. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. So friends, it is not the gospel of the South African church. It is not the gospel of the American church. It is not the gospel of the Western church, of the white church, of the black church, of the Asian church. It is the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's a gospel where his kingdom shows up, where his superior realm shows up where people get healed where people get delivered where miracles break out where love is being restored to the bride of christ and that's why jesus prayed what is often referred to as the lord's prayer a prayer that we all know so well a prayer that we recite and he says in matthew 6 verse 9 to 10 he says our father in heaven Hallowed by, be your name, your kingdom, this kingdom that I've been teaching people on. He says, pray this way, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So he said, biggering in heaven, he said, division in heaven, he said, sickness in heaven, he said, polarization in heaven, he said, a black church or a white church. Or a left church or a right church in heaven. No, there isn't. And Jesus is saying, it is also not allowed here on earth. Whatever is in heaven, our assignment is to create the same conditions on earth as it is in heaven. And we have the authority to release the kingdom reality of heaven down here on earth. And Jesus came and says, I didn't come with a political agenda. I didn't come to pick sides. I love the Jews as much as I love the Romans. I love the Democrats as much as I love the Republicans, as much as I love the DA or the ANC or the Christian Democratic Party or the EFF. I've come for you all and I'm inviting you all into this new way of kingdom thinking, but you have to repent Otherwise, you're going to get offended and you are going to come with a human narrative, human systems, and it is just going to bring chaos, division, and hatred among one another. So we have the authority to create on earth what is in heaven, but we have to change the way we think about the kingdom. Jesus is saying we are not subject to this natural realm. We have access to a superior realm, a realm of peace, of joy, of hope, of miracle signs, of wonders, of healing. And it doesn't look like fear. It doesn't look like judgment. It doesn't look like anxiety, like striving, bickering. It looks like, like life flowing from your innermost being and affecting the world around you. And friends, this is what we are part of. This is who you are. This is who I am. This is what we are part of. And the devil is doing all he can for us to think and reason from a lower realm of thinking. And God is saying, don't settle for inferior thinking. Don't settle for this inferior kingdom if I've given you access to a superior realm a superior kingdom. So coming back to the Sermon of, on the Mount, if you were there, if I were there, would we be willing to step into this kingdom realm? Would we be willing to repent to God's way of thinking? And by the way, the kingdom of heaven doesn't advance by good actions. It advances 
by right thinking because right thinking leads to right doing or will we hold on to our hurts our pain our ways our narratives will we hold on to us versus them will we hold on to but they don't understand but will we hold on to but you don't know what they did to me will we hold on to i have to get back at them it's now my time to cash in and they have to suffer or will we hold on to a kingdom where there's mercy, where there's forgiveness, where there's reconciliation, where there's generous acts of kindness? Will we repent to kingdom living? And I'm going to close by looking at the Roman Empire of that day just to illustrate what Jesus was teaching on. During the day where Jesus launched his ministry, when he worked the earth, the Roman Empire, when it was in its heyday, it was a huge kingdom. It was a powerful kingdom. And it was a pressure that kept them together. And so the Roman Empire, the Caesars, they, they were continually um, advancing their kingdom. They were continually taking new territory and so often what the Caesars would do, whichever Caesar were in power, whenever they would take new territory or they were about to take new territory, they would occupy new land by force, with, um, with um, military force. They would send the military ahead of them. And what they would do is the military leaders were called apostles. And so they would send these apostles before them, led by these apostles, and when a new territory came under Roman rule and under Roman control, the Romans would use force to create the same conditions in a new territory that exists in Rome. So they would do everything in their power. And that was the job. That was the assignment. That was the mandate of the Roman apostles to create the same conditions in a new territory that existed in Rome so they would they would build Roman temples they would introduce um, Roman education systems they would build Roman baths they would introduce Roman culture um, to the new territory um, they would introduce Roman arts to the new territory they would do everything they could do to make the Roman the, the new territory look exactly like Rome. They would force people um, to speak um, like the Romans. Why would they do that? For this one reason, that if ever the Caesar would go and visit the new taken territory, he would feel exactly like he would feel at home. When he would visit a new territory, they would try and create an environment that when the Caesar stepped into that new territory, he would feel immediately at home. He would feel like he would be in Rome. And so that's exactly what the kingdom of heaven is like. That's why Jesus called his disciples apostles. The word apostles weren't a Christian word. It was a word that Jesus borrowed from the Romans. He says, I'm sending you with an apostolic mandate. I'm sending you with this assignment to create the same conditions here on earth as in heaven. That is what the kingdom is like. The kingdom of God is when everything in this realm, in this earthly realm, reflects and becomes exactly like the heavenly realm and it starts to look like heaven. And I want you to think about it. After all, the king is coming back. Jesus is coming back, and when Jesus is coming back, will he find a world that reflects his will? Will he reflect the earth that look exactly like heaven? And Jesus is saying, I want you to repent. I want you to start thinking what heaven looks like so that you can live on earth as it is in heaven, with hope, with the miraculous, with the supernatural, with peace. Change the narrative because you've got the authority to make it happen on earth 
as it is in heaven. So let us close in prayer. Father, I thank you that you are inviting us into your kingdom realm. And so Lord, this morning, we repent, we repent to a higher way. We change the way we think about the kingdom. And I pray, Lord, I pray for grace to be released this morning. I pray, Lord, for a anointing to be released on your church and your beautiful bride. Father, with these areas in our thinking and our reasoning, in our, in our way of doing life that doesn't reflect your kingdom reality. Lord, I pray that you will reveal those areas to us. Lord, that we will repent, that we will think in a new way, that we will change the way we think. Lord, I pray that there will be impartation this morning. Lord, that just like it was that day on the Sermon on the Mount. Lord, that we will see, that we will get a glimpse of what your kingdom looks like. And Lord, I pray that you will, Lord, this morning, that, Lord, that your a vision and a desire for your kingdom will burn so passionately and so strong in our hearts that we will lay down our lives. And Lord, this morning, that we will come to you and say, Lord, I lay down my way. Lord, I lay down my pride. I lay down my hurt. I lay down my opinions and my narrative because I'm so hungry to see your kingdom burst forth in my family, in my neighborhood, in my community, in our nation. Lord, I pray that instead of judgment, instead of pointing fingers to our leaders, instead of judging people um, for all the harm that's been done to us, the persecution that we experience, that we will show radical mercy, that we will live with radical generosity and kindness towards other people, and that we will show the church, when the, the, the gates flung open, and we can meet together as one body, that we will show the world, this is what the kingdom looks like, and we have access to create and live with that reality here on earth. In Jesus' name. Papa God, I pray a blessing over every person that is tuned in to this Facebook Live message this morning. To those who were watching, watch it later on YouTube um, or a recorded message, bless him. Lord, I pray for grace to be released. Grace to accomplish that which we can't do in our own strength. I thank you, Lord, that we don't celebrate perfection. We celebrate progress. I thank you that Lord, you don't give up on us. I thank you that you believe in us more than we do. And I pray, Lord, Father, that you will just bless us as we go forth this week to live out the reality of your kingdom in Jesus' name. Friend, God bless you. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a super week. And uh, remember... You are better than the current thought that you have about yourself. Bless you.